Welcome to this heat transfer video lecture. In this lecture we're going to continue talking about one-dimensional steady-state systems. In particular we're going to talk about heat transfer from extended surfaces. So we've talked a lot about thermal resistance and a lot of the examples we've given have been where we're trying to decrease the flow of heat transfer so we're trying to add insulation and increase the thermal resistance. But in a lot of applications we may actually want to increase the flow of heat. So in order to increase heat transfer we may want to decrease the thermal resistance. So ways to decrease the thermal resistance would be increasing the thermal conductivity of a solid, increasing the convective coefficient of a fluid, increasing our delta T or our driving force if you have a hotter surface going to a cooler ambient then you'll get more heat transfer that way and uh, you could actually change the design of your system to increase the surface area. So I'm showing here a couple of examples of how you might increase the surface area. So you notice this is a, um, a heat exchanger on the right. So that heat exchanger is carrying some kind of fluid through these tubes and you may be exchanging that, it's likely a liquid on the inside, you may be exchanging heat with a gas going through. So having all these extra fins or little, uh, all this extra surface area is gonna give you a higher area. So by Newton's law of cooling, you have HA, delta T, so by increasing that area you certainly increase the total amount of heat transfer. This is a transformer here on the left and you can see um, those can get really hot because of all the electrical activity that's going on inside. So you want to keep them cool, so to keep it cool you could extend, have all these fins coming out of it to increase the surface area there. And the net effect of all of that would be to decrease the thermal resistance and increase the total rate of heat transfer. So uh, if you're looking at a what's called a base, so if we looked at our base surface with no fin enhancement, it would give off heat according to Newton's law of cooling at, this, at the edge by H A T S times T infinity. But if we were able to extend that, then we increase H, I mean we increase A quite dramatically, so we're able to drastically increase Q by adding all this extra surface area. So these fins can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Here you can see some heat exchanger applications where you're exchanging energy between a liquid and a gas. So having all these extra disks going around your pipes certainly enhances heat transfer. Um, similarly on the right here you have these rectangular shaped fins that encompass all of the liquid flow channels. So the net result is a lot more area for heat transfer so you get much more heat transfer. The fins themselves can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. This would come down to just uh, how you're designing the system. So here we have A, this rectangular shaped uh, fins coming out. You could have triangular, disc shaped, or cone shaped. And the heat transfer analysis that will go into each of those is obviously going to be quite different. In particular, we're going to focus on fins that have a uniform cross-sectional area, mean, meaning that the further out you go, in terms of X, the um, your cross-sectional area does not change. For some of these, in particular this one, you may want to stick with a cylindrical coordinate system and go out radially. But hopefully you are starting to realize how to do energy balances here to derive your own equation so that you could solve for the temperature profile of each of these. When we solve these problems, one key approximation that we're going to make is called the thin-fin approximation. So if here we have our base, and let's assume this one is dissipating heat, so it's hot, indicated by the red, and we're losing energy um, as we go outward, well this is going to be convecting all the way along, so it's naturally going to cool. One assumption that we'll make is that heat transfer only occurs in one direction. And I'm not talking about the band, they are awesome but we're going to stick with heat transfer here. So by assuming heat transfer only in one direction, it means that in this direction, we are assuming that it's isothermal. So if this is radially, or if this is um, Y or Z, then we're assuming that heat transfer doesn't vary in that direction. And we do that because this fin is so narrow. So this fin or pin or plate, um, it's narrow, so that means temperature doesn't vary much in the R or the Y or Z directions, 
because that heat doesn't have very far to go before it's convecting out to ambient. So energy varies primarily in the x direction and we're just going to neglect any two-dimensional effects of heat transfer in those other directions. So we are assuming that at x equals zero our temperature is the same as the base temperature. So that will be one of our boundary conditions. And then the fin is losing heat by convection. Again, as I mentioned, as you go out, it's losing more and more heat. So as x increases, then the fin gets cooler and cooler the further out you go. The way that we're going to analyze these systems is just by, similar to the way we've used the heat equation in the past, except we won't actually use the heat equation. This is a little bit different um, because we have that convection happening continuously out the sides. But we will use Fourier's law and we'll do this conduction analysis and just do an energy balance. The difference between this and the heat equation is of course that uh, at every node along the way your solid will be exposed to convection. So that just makes the equation look a little bit different. When we have fins of uniform cross-sectional area, again meaning that the further out in x you go it means that your cross-sectional area or the area normal to the flow of heat is normal to the flow of conductive heat at least is going to be constant so that could be true of a rectangular fin or a cylindrical fin we're going to end up with a differential equation that looks like this which we will need to solve so let's go ahead and try and and refresh our memory on how to do an energy balance like this to come up with such an equation so if we draw our fin here we would take here's the base so we would take an arbitrary slice of this and we'll say that this is delta x units wide. So we would have energy coming in by conduction. So we're going to have qx coming in and then we're going to have qx plus delta x leaving our system. So there's going to be no accumulation in this system. We're going to have in, out, and we're also going to neglect generation here. So we're just dealing with in and out terms. So our in term is going to be the energy coming in as measured at point x, and out is going to be the energy going out as measured at point x plus delta x. We can quantify these terms a lot better by using Fourier's law. So here we'd get minus k times dt dx as measured at x and then our surface area we'll just call it a c we want to keep this fairly generic because you could have different shapes that uh, with all kinds of different cross-sectional areas and similarly going out oh and i neglected one of our out key out terms okay also going out we have the energy going out by conduction is minus k dt dx as measured at x plus delta x and because this is uniform cross-sectional area we'll use the same AC there but then we also have energy leaving by convection so we're going to use Newton's law of cooling here so we're going to use H A times delta T the area that we're going to use is going to be our perimeter around the system multiplied by delta x and then we're going to have T minus T infinity. So as we compile this equation we're going to get 0 which is our accumulation term is equal to n. So we've got minus k dt dx as measured at x and then we're going to subtract off our out term so this sign changes. So here we get plus k dt dx as measured at x plus delta x and we're going to take that whole quantity and multiply that by the cross-sectional area and then we subtract off our other out term which is convection h p delta x times t minus t infinity so we can recognize here the definition of the derivative so we're going to get a derivative of of a derivative here. So a quantity measured at x plus delta x divided by a quantity measured at x. Um, if we take that whole quantity and divide it by delta x, then that's the definition of a derivative. So first we're going to want to divide by delta x, 
and then we're going to take the limit as delta x goes to zero. So the equation that we're going to end up here is zero equals d by dx times k dt dx multiplied by cross-sectional area minus h p and remember we divided through by delta x so we get h p times t minus t infinity if we have constant thermal conductivity we can pull k out of here and we end up with zero is equal to k times the second derivative of temperature with respect to x squared minus h p t minus t infinity so as you can see, we actually do arrive at the same form of the equation. So we'll call this the Finn equation. I'll just do that. So here, this is the, the called the Finn equation. So let's look at how we're going to go about solving this equation. So we take our equation, the second order differential equation. In order to make this a homogeneous differential equation, we're going to define a, di a new variable, theta, as a function of x. And theta is just defined as the temperature at whatever point you are down the distance of this fin. Subtract your ambient temperature. This is known as the excess temperature. And this is really just an algebraic simplification we're going to make to our problem to make the integration a little bit easier. So substituting in theta, we see that because t infinity is just a constant, the second derivative of temperature with respect to x is equivalent to the second derivative of theta with respect to x. And then we subtract off this, here we have the excess temperature, and we're going to lump all of those parameters into this variable called m squared. So m squared is just defined as all those parameters, and there's a little bit of a method to why we're putting in a squared there. So when we do the integration, I'm going to skip this part, uh, we end up getting this the solution to this equation um, in general form is looks like this. So it's a homogeneous differential equation, we get that form. We're going to need to apply boundary conditions. So as you should recall, when you're, when you're dealing with a second order differential equation, you're going to have two boundary conditions for every spatial variable. So we need to apply our boundary conditions. So the boundary condition here at the base is always going to be the same. That our theta at x equals zero is just the base temperature minus t infinity. So this is basically a constant surface temperature boundary condition. It's just saying we we know the temperature here, it's just our base temperature. So what happens on the right side? What type of boundary condition would we use? And you can actually use a variety of different types of boundary conditions. So at the base we have this constant surface temperature, and then at the tip, so here's the tip, we can have a wide variety of boundary conditions which include convection. So convection is the obvious one because this thing is convecting at all of the surfaces so why wouldn't it convect at the tip however to make the math a little bit easier you can make other simplifying approximations so you could assume an infinitely long fin so basically when you do that you're just assuming that t at l is just equal to t infinity you're assuming that this fin is so long that by the time you get to the very tip of it it's just equal to ambient temperature you can also assume an adiabatic tip so you can just neglect what's happening at the tip and that makes the math even easier okay so here are oh and you also could have a prescribed temperature you could just know what the temperature is that's one that i neglected so depending on the tip condition, so here in this column we have the tip condition, what's going on at x equals L? So we would have convection, the adiabatic, this fixed temperature, and then the infinite fin. And when you do, when you solve for your constants of integration, your temperature distribution can look a lot different. And notice these temperature distributions look a little funky because they're using these reduced variables, theta, and theta b, they're also using m. So this table, which is table 3.4 from the book, can be really handy. And here down at the bottom, you can just see 
how are all those different things defined. So if you want to transform this equation into something that looks like an actual temperature distribution, you could just make these substitutions for theta and theta b into that equation. And then you'd also want to make the substitution for m, where you take the square root of this quantity to represent m. Okay, so that based on our tip condition we're going to get that our solution looks a lot different, the temperature profile looks a lot different depending on those four different solutions and this infinite fin ends up giving us the simplest looking solution but we'll, you just have to use your engineering judgment here to determine which tip condition you're going to use. Similarly the you can quantify and get the total heat transfer rate. So we've added these fins because we want to enhance heat transfer. So a really useful thing to know would be, okay, well, how much heat transfer am I going to, to, to have? So this QF is the total rate of heat that the fin is giving off, which would have units of watts. And you can do some plug and chug, and you can figure out what these different rates of heat transfer are, depending on our tip condition. So this is one case I've tried to emphasize doing the energy balance, solving the differential equation for yourself. In this case, we're going to be doing a lot more plug and chug. So if you know that you have a fin and you know what the tip condition you're going to use, I'm perfectly fine with go ahead and going ahead and using it here. Keep in mind the assumptions that go into this, which would be a steady state. We're using that thin fin approximation where temperature only varies in one direction. And we're assuming constant thermal conductivity and we're, this is also, these solutions are specifically for fins of uniform cross-section, so the fin isn't getting any bigger or smaller the further out you go axially. But this table can be a really useful tool to have when you're dealing with fins.